Hello class. So um, we are finally at the last portion. So this is the part two of the two-part series in our discussion for CREATE Act of 2021. Um, just continuing on with section 27D as to intercorporate dividends and its treatment. So um, we are still within the purview of domestic corporation. Huh? Um, this is a quite important provision because there has been um, a, re a relevant amendment to this particular section, okay? Uh, if you may have recalled in your individual income tax, um, an individual receiving a dividend from a corporation is subject to passive income final tax. So it's plain and simple. But with respect to intercorporate dividend, the rules are a bit... Um, complex okay so we have to distinguish the source of the dividend from the uh, recipient okay so i hope that's clear now in the first place what are dividends so these are um earnings okay so annually or quarterly the corporation earns okay so when they have a positive taxable income uh, some of their um uh, income will go to the retained earnings, okay? So these are accumulated throughout the years. And then there, there is a time that the board of directors will decide that a portion of that retained, a reasonable portion of the retained earnings will be distributed to the shareholders, okay? So in this uh, aspect, the shareholders will receive dividend income subject to tax. So if the recipient is an individual, it's a, it's a uh, passive tax. If it's a, uh, Corporation, well, it's also a passive income subject to final tax. But there are different tax treatment as to, uh, as I said, the source and the recipient of the dividend. So first and foremost, um, if the dividend is received by a domestic corporation, okay, presumably from another domestic corporation, it's plain and simple. It's not subject to tax. It's tax exempt, okay? Okay. Um, However, if the uh, dividend income is foreign sourced, okay, if, if it's foreign sourced, ibig sabihin, it could be from a resident foreign corporation or a non-resident foreign corporation. So the rule is generally it is exempt provided that the following criteria are met. So uh, take note, we are still in the context of a domestic corporation earning income. So the recipient in this case is a domestic corporation. The source is a foreign source uh, uh, corporation. Okay, so according to Section 27B, and this is an, an uh, amendment provi amended provision, sorry, um, for it to be exempt, the foreign source dividends, the funds from which such dividends uh, are received by the domestic corporation is actually remitted into the Philippines. So there is an actual distribution of such fund and upon uh, receipt of that fund, it is immediately reinvested by such domestic corporation within the next taxable year. You know? So kailangan, if na receive mo this year, the next year, it should be reinvested. And there are uh, specific activities allowed um, into which these uh, received uh, dividend income be invested. So it shall be either invested as a working capital requirement. So what is a working capital requirement? No? So um, in, in simple terms, the, the funds that you use in the day-to-day -day operations of your uh, business. In accounting, it's simply current asset minus current liabilities, okay? Uh, if it's added to your working capital, then, you know, it can be accept, okay? Capital expenditures, okay? So if upon receipt of this dividend income, the domestic corporation purchase some equipments or they uh, purchase um, or they expand the business, okay? So that's considered capital expenditure. Dividend payment. So of course, a corporation may also uh, because the recipient is a corporation itself. No? So as a rule, they can also in turn uh, distribute dividends to their shareholders. Okay, So if the fund received from a foreign source corporation uh, is given no? uh, eventually as dividend payment to its own shareholders, 
then it also is exempt from tax. Or if it's um, invested in a domestic subsidiary. So this corporation, especially big corporation, they have affiliates, uh, they have branches, they have subsidiaries, okay? So if this uh, fund received as a dividend income is reinvested to the subsidiaries and also infrastructure projects, so if they conduct some infrastructure project, okay, it's also uh, exempt. So this is to further enhance the build, build, build program by the Duterte administration because this uh, private corporation can also, you know, as, a, as, um, as another uh, uh, nature of its operation, it can also conduct uh, infrastructure projects. So it can also uh, participate in the bidding, such as uh, San Miguel Corporation. No? So akala natin, San Miguel Corporation is just a beverage, but little do we know that they have expanded their business into um, uh, what you call this, into construction projects as well. So meron din silang malalaking uh, construction projects na binibid nila uh, with the government. So sila yung nag implement So aside from, from that, they also have um, several other businesses. I think they also have power plants, okay, in the electric industry naman. So these big corporations can, you know, branch out and expand their businesses into other ventures, okay? Um, aside from reinvestment requirement, the so foreign source uh, dividend to be exempt, uh, the domestic corporation must uh, hold directly at least 20% of the outstanding shares. So, we big sabihin nun class, kailangan may significant influence in domestic corporation doon sa foreign source. So simply, if the, uh, simply natin, if the outstanding shares of the foreign corporation is 100,000 shares, the domestic corporation must own at least 20,000 shares of that. Okay? And that shareholding is held by the domestic corporation for a minimum of two years, recon from the time of dividends distribution. So very, very tedious ang requirement no, for this foreign source dividend to be exempt. It must be reinvested within the next taxable year, the domestic corporation, uh, to, before that, no, to, to limited activities, okay? The domestic corporation must have significant influence over the foreign source, uh, for, over the foreign corporation in accounting, 20% uh, ownership is called significant influence, whereas 50% or more is called control, okay? So the holdings must be held for at least two, two years, okay? So those are uh, no, uh, strict requirements. Now, um, so this is to further make, you know, my, my uh, simple attempt at making you further understand uh, you know, the interplay between different corporations and their uh, dividends, so intercorporate dividends. So on the left part, these are the sources of the dividend. On the right part, the recipient. So plain and simple, if it's domestic corporation to a domestic corporation tax exempt, a domestic corporation giving dividend to a resident foreign corporation, it's tax exempt, Okay. Domestic corporation to a non-resident foreign corporation, there is a, a specific provision of the law on that. No? So it's subject to final withholding tax because a non-resident foreign corporation is likened to a non-resident alien uh, not engaged in trade or business. So lahat halos ng income niya are subject to final withholding tax. So it's also subject to tax treaty, which we will further discuss later on. And then finally, Yung uh, immediately preceding provision, Section 24D on foreign source corporation to domestic corporation tax exempt if all of these uh, uh, criteria are complied with. So reinvested to certain activities, 20 years own, uh, twenty percent ownership and two, two years holding. So to clarify class, because ang nakalagay kasi doon sa... Section 27B, foreign source. So, ano bang classing foreign source yun? Okay, so, um, basically, um, 
it pertains to a resident foreign corporation. No? So, um, the BIR, from time to time, they would issue revenue regulations to clarify certain provisions of the law because they are the implementers. So in this particular instance, it clarified what is meant by foreign source. Okay, So Section 5 of the Revenue Regulation Number 5-2021, which in the other sectors of our discussions, in the Part 1, I was also... Uh, you know, little by little introducing to you itong mga interpretation na to. So, um, remember the provision on proprietary educational institutions and hospital. So, can clarify yun ng similar revenue regulation, uh, RR number 5-2021. So, anyways, um, let us look at this illustration to further clarify the matter. So, uh, Corporation X, a resident foreign corporation, has a gross income for a three-year period of 500 million from sources within the Philippines. However, no, Shembre, it's uh, a foreign corporation. It's possible that it can also uh, receive income from outside the Philippines, amounting to 300 million. And 2021, it declared dividend amounting to 10 million pesos. 5 million pesos of which was paid to Corporation Z, a domestic corporation. So um, half of the dividend okay, is uh, paid to Z, a domestic corporation. So this is a foreign source, or, uh, foreign source dividend received by a domestic corporation. So very clear. To determine the tax treatment of the dividend received by a domestic corporation, there is a need to determine if the dividend paid by RFC is sourced within the Philippines or not. Okay, so in this scenario, it qualified a source within the Philippines since the gross income of uh, this foreign, uh, foreign corporation is uh, from within, which is more than 50% of its total gross income. So you have to compare. Okay, to be considered a source within the Philippines, you have to compare which of the different source income of this foreign corporation, uh, uh, it, which portion of that is sourced in the Philippines. So if more than 50% of its total gross income is sourced from the Philippines, then the rule is that it is exempt. No? So the dividend income received by the domestic corporation, Corporation Z, is exempt from income tax even without compliance with a condition. Okay. Um, conversely, if the gross income of Corporation X from within is less than 50% of its total gross income, then the dividend received shall be considered as sourced outside and therefore must comply with the condition imposed under Section 5 of the Revenue Regulation. So, plain and simple. No need to comply with the three requirements, not the investment, 20%, and two years. If uh, the income, uh, if the dividend income is deemed source within, because the resident foreign corporation um, have earned its uh, income, more than 50% of its income from the Philippines. Okay. However, Literal foreign source because it is deemed you know, mostly uh, earned outside because if the gross income of the resident foreign corporation is uh, from within is less than 50% of its total gross income, then um, the dividend is naturally considered to be foreign sourced or sourced without and therefore must comply with the condition imposed upon by, uh, by the revenue regulation and the law. So... Again, ha, if it's more than 50% of the gross income is earned within, it's deemed to be earned within. However, if less than 50% is earned within the Philippines, then it's deemed foreign source. So the three conditions must apply. Now, moving on with uh, another kind of corporation is uh, what we call as resident foreign corporation. So, um, Para din siyang sa individual, parang ano, similar siya sa resident alien. Okay, so a resident foreign corporation is established outside the Philippines. However, it's doing business in the Philippines. So yung sect 
registration niya outside or yung creation niya outside but it's doing most of its uh, businesses in the Philippines. So it has um, a regular source of income no? or it has business operation conducted in the Philippines. So prior to the CREATE Act, it's taxed at 30% and now it's subject to the regular corporate rate at, under Section 28 at 25%, just like the domestic corporation. So similar sila ng tax rate. The tax base, uh, however, is different. If a domestic corporation is taxable for all of its income, a resident foreign corporation is only taxable on income sourced within. So doon sa previous example natin, out of the uh, 800 million income, yung 500 million lang ang taxable sa Philippine uh jurisdiction with respect to the resident foreign corporation. Now, a resident foreign corporation is also subject to the MCIT. So as you may have recalled, uh, under the CREATE law from July 1 to 20, uh, 2020 to June 30, 2023, or this is the COVID-19 pandemic era, MCIT is 1%. So after 2023, it now it goes back to the two percent rate, which is which was the rate no prior to the amendment. Um, as I said, beginning the fourth year of operations of a, uh, a resident foreign corporation, they have to compare whichever is greater between their normal corporate tax rate of 25 percent and MCIT of one percent. No? So the higher of which they will have to pay that tax. Okay, so this is naman to uh, avoid no, the scheme used by, you know, scrupulous corporation who always tend to have a net taxable, uh, net taxable loss. Okay, so laging negative yung result ng op operation simply to avoid payment of taxes. So alternatively, the MCIT is applied on not on the taxable income or net loss or net income, but on the gross income. So as I said, uh, sales minus direct cost, gross income. So that's the tax base for the MCIT. Yung regular, tax, uh, regular corporate income tax naman is uh, sales minus direct cost minus indirect cost or deductible expenses. So you have the net taxable income, okay? So the tax base is different and you have to compare these two amounts, whichever the higher of which is the one to be paid by the corporation. I don't think naman that the bar exam will make you compute, okay? Um, so it's just uh, enough you know, that you, you have sufficient knowledge on, on the application of the law. Tax on branch profit remittances. So it is also considered as a resident foreign corporation because these are actually companies that are, you know, maintaining offices um, in the Philippines. So, so most of their activities are sourced in the Philippines. However, the only difference is that regional or area headquarters don't have um, sales or gross receipts. They don't, they, they, they don't operate to earn income in the Philippines. So their activity uh, in the Philippines are limited to managerial, supervisory, some marketing or research. Okay, so these are a branch or a headquarter of a multinational corporation. Okay, so uh, uso yan ngayon class no, with the globalization and all. So as a general rule, it's not taxable. Don't confuse this class with the you know, special special tax rates on special individuals if doon sa discussion natin on individual income tax kasi ang ang subject matter naman noon is yung mga employed nitong mga uh, area headquarters or operating headquarters so meron din silang special tax rates no? so that's a different view because that pertains to those individuals employed by this um Res special kinds of resident foreign corporation. Ito sila, the one that we're discussing right now is the corporation itself. The regional operating headquarters is, again, a branch of 
a MNC or a multinational corporation, and it earns income, a regular source of uh, income from operations in the Philippines. So its activities is, uh, you know, inclusive of all of those um, operate, um, you know, the 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 selling of products or the offering of services, similar with the. Um, with the services offered by its head office, okay? So, effective January 1, 2022, it is, na, it is now taxable at the normal corporate tax rate. But this 10% is uh, usually in those, uh, no, taxable within those COVID uh, period. No? So, as I said, from July 1, 2022, yun, uh, December 31, 2021, 10% of taxable income. So, balik tayo sa 25%. I don't know, class, no? Bakit yung COVID uh, effect on each of these different tax rates are not um, uniform? Kasi yung iba... May June 30, 2023, nag end Meron namang Jan ito, January 1, 2022. Yung iba, uh, July naman, 2022. So, uh, okay, so um, aside from those uh, headquarters of multinational corporations, there are special resident foreign corporations subject to special tax rates. So, mas maliit. No? So, uh, obviously, it's a 2.5% and 10%. So, you just have to uh, stick to your mind that if it's an international carrier on their gross Philippine dealing, it's a 2.5%. Okay? If it's naman an interest income by a foreign currency deposit unit from foreign currency loans granted to residents other than offshore banking units, then it's 10%. So it's a mouthful. No? Um, don't be confused, class, ha? because these, these, um, there is a reason behind why they are taxed differently. Okay. Um, in all of these instances, class, uh, they pave way you know, to, to our international trade. Because these international carriers, they may be, um, you know, with those, for example, international flights. You know, so they don't only carry on passengers, but also um, exports, import trades, okay, which is the, the Philippines uh, benefits with, okay. Um, as to interest income by a foreign currency deposit unit from foreign currency loan, so it's also uh, paves way to the international trade entered into by the Philippines with the other countries. So that's why it's also taxed a little uh, lesser at 10%. Um, later on, we will focus as well on these foreign currency deposit units as to the passive income. In your individual income tax, meron din tayong uh, passive income of which. Now, um, take note that this interest income uh, by a foreign cur cur currency deposit unit is other than the OPU. So there's a difference between a foreign currency deposit unit and, a, and an offshore banking unit. So you have to take note of that. A uh, foreign currency deposit unit may be owned by a domestic bank, okay, which has a different division. So, meron silang uh, local currency division, and then meron din silang foreign currency deposit unit, okay. So, the interest income earned by this uh, resident foreign corporation, which has a foreign currency deposit unit. So aside from a domestic corporation, a resident foreign corporation may also have their uh, FCBUs. No? So it's not limited to domestic banks. Um, of course, being banks, they earn their income from interest from loans. Okay, so you, you, the perspective is in the perspective of a corporation which operates as a bank. Okay, so if it... Um, offers loan, foreign currency loans, and, you know, as a result of that loan, it earns interest income. 
such interest income by the foreign currency deposit unit is taxed at 10%. Now, it's different because in OBU, um, the scenario is different because kaya nga sinabing offshore banking unit because uh, first and foremost, it's not uh, really subject to the regulation of the central bank kasi nga offshore. So parang it's an extension of a multinational bank which uh, activities are limited to uh, you know international uh, uh, transaction okay or it may act as an inter intermediary between uh, uh, international transaction between several banks or between uh, an individual from another country to another country okay that's why an OBU is always, always a non-resident foreign corporation. Okay, so I hope that's clear. So again, they are uh, taxed a little smaller than the regular rates for resident foreign corporation because they enhance the uh, international trade um, engaged in by the country. Okay, so they are somehow beneficial to our international trade. Okay. Um, these are naman uh, passive income tax rates for certain resident foreign corporations. So, you know, uh, just like individuals, uh, these are the uh, subjected rates you know, implemented by the law when the resident foreign corporation earns interest from deposit yield. So, wala namang... Uh, problema dito no so simply a cash in bank okay royalty income okay income from foreign currency deposit unit so in this case yung kanina the income is sourced from the loan because the the one that earns the income is the bank which is which happens to be a resident foreign corporation in this case naman uh, the rest the tax the what you call it? It's it's the taxable uh, entity here is a resident foreign corporation who simply uh, deposits in a foreign currency deposit unit. So depositor dito yung uh, or investor dito yung uh, RFC. Okay, income from a foreign currency deposit unit. Yung doon is income from a foreign currency loan earned by an FCDU of a bank, which happens to be a resident foreign corporation, okay? Um, for capital gains from stocks not traded, the, the mechanism here class is just the same with um, your individual income tax. Um, for stocks that are traded, it's 0.6%. Okay? So those are passive income tax rates. Now, let us go to non-resident foreign corporation. So, as I said, 30%, 25%, so similar with the DC and the RFC. The only difference is the tax base, gross income, because as I said, they don't really operate in the Philippines. They don't earn uh, income from regular operations. Most of their income are subject to final withholding taxes, 25%. Tax source is within only. So, okay. So, again, these are uh, special income tax rates naman for non-resident foreign corporations. So, reinsurance premium exam, interest on foreign loans, 20%. Dividend from domestic corporation, 25%, but subject to a lower rate of 15%. If the country in which the corporation is domiciled either does not impose income tax on such dividends or allows a tax credit of 15% deemed paid. So it's 10% beginning July 1, 2020. Or the difference between the CIT and 15% tax on dividends. Treaty rates ranging from 10 to 25% may apply if the recipient is a resident of a country with which the Philippines is a tax treaty. Okay, so um, let's go back. Sorry. So 
So you may um, wonder why when these requirements are complied with the dividend by a non-resident foreign corporation from a DC is taxed at a preferential rate. Now, simply class, just to encourage no, um, investment in our country. Okay, so syempre, a non-resident foreign corporation will only receive dividend from a domestic corporation if it invests in a domestic corporation. So um, it will encourage more, the non-resident foreign corporation will be encouraged more to invest in our country if it's home country, like for example, Germany. No? So a German company invests into a uh, Philippine company and its home country, Germany, does not uh, apply or does not burden it with additional tax you know, for whatever dividend it earns from its investment, of course, it will encourage more the uh, non-resident foreign corporation to pursue such investment. So if, if that happens, if there is a uh, deemed tax credit allowed by the home country of the uh, non-resident foreign corporation, then it will um, enjoy a lower rate of 15%. In fact, 10%. No? Um, also, if there are tax treaties between the Philippines and the uh, and the home country of the NRFC, then such tra tax treaties uh, shall also apply. So just to simplify, it is um, a way to encourage investment in the country. Aside from that, uh, these are also generally lower rates than the usual 25% because uh, these are either making our international trade more efficient. No? So if, if uh, or making our life easier because syempre yung mga vessels, um, aircrafts, machineries, and equipments owned by non-resident foreign corporation, it saves the Philippines the cost of which because you know generally we don't have these equipments so usually we rent from this uh, resident foreign corporation or non-resident foreign corporations so it makes our life easier especially in trade or um, in the uh, doing of the day-to-day -day business operation so instead of purchasing this uh, heavily costed capital expenditure we just rent from this non-resident foreign corporation so in in return of that, they uh, to encourage naman, uh, you know, continuing with making us rent their properties, we offer them preferential tax rate. No? So aside from the previously discussed, this is also another way to encourage non-resident foreign corporation to invest their equipments in the Philippines. So if it's the rental income earned from vessels, okay, chartered by Philippine nationals, it's 4.5%. Rental of aircraft, machineries, and other equipment, 7.5%. So um, as a new tax rate, capital gains from stocks not traded, so similar in sa RFC and sa DC, so it's 15%. And capital gains from stocks traded, so it's more simplified, no? hindi na kina-differentiate, so 0.6%. Okay. Now moving on with the deductions class. Uh, actually, it's it's quite similar with the enumerated items in your tax on individuals, uh, except for certain um, siguro differences on the rates and on certain applications. Okay. Um, what is new is this section thirty four. So this is uh not considered before before the CREATE Act. This is a new one. Um, also, um, in line na rin with the K-12 program of Aquino administration, di ba? Um, kaya nga, in, dinagdaga ng dalawang taon yung senior high because uh, ideally, hindi mo na kailangan magtapos uh, ng college for you to be able to uh, work in a company or to, to acquire skills to allow you to apply in these different uh, corporations. Okay, so uh, corollary to that, you know, any labor training expense incurred by this corporation naman, 
is uh, allowed as a deduction from their gross income. Because of course, these senior highs are, you know, recently just off from school. Wala pa silang experience. So it's the company that, you know, ideally will train them. And it will cost the company to train these apprentices or these uh, newly skilled employees. So any expenses incurred by these companies who adhere to this program of the government will receive additional 50% deduction. So subject to the following conditions. So kailangan daw, the additional 50% deduction shall not exceed 10% of the direct labor wage. It must be covered by an apprenticeship agreement, okay? And it must be supported by DepEd, CHED, or TESDA certification. So they must acquire certification from these educational uh, agencies, regulatory agencies, to be able to uh, be allowed a 50% of labor training expense. Okay, so this is the uh, provision, exact provision, section 34AV, okay? An additional deduction from taxable income of one half of the value of labor training expenses incurred for skills development of enterprise-based trainees enrolled in public senior high schools, public higher education institutions, or public technical and uh, vocational, uh, vocational institutions and uh, duly covered by an apprenticeship agreement, okay, under the labor code shall be granted to the enterprise, provided further that for the additional deduction, okay, the enterprise shall secure proper certification from DepEd, TESTA, or CHED. And finally, that such deduction shall not exceed 10% of direct labor wage. So under the labor code, an apprentice, no, um, a skilled worker who is a senior high graduate or who is a graduate from TESTA is entitled to 75% of the regular wage of a regular worker. Well, you know, uh, personally, siguro this is applicable to first world countries na may mga ano, sophisticated uh, training programs or those really, really big companies that can cater to, uh, to, this, ano, to these workers who could guide them in an apprenticeship agreement. Eh, sa Philippine setting natin, nag-aagawan na nga tayo ng trabaho because, you know, the there is um, too much labor force, but too little work. And um, based on experience na rin, because I've handled cases na, uh, you know, on, uh, on labor cases, and also I've also interviewed some workers, talaga yung mga company, they would prefer na yung hire nila is at least second year level sa college. Kasi pag bagong graduate ka kasi sa ano, grade 12, uh, nene ka pa, no? so you, you're a bit too young for the corporate setting, like factory work. So these companies will, you know, prefer you may content experience and um, medyo ano, mature yung age. So I, I, don't, I don't know how to, ano, to, to co correlate this with, uh, with the plan of the government. But, you know, if ever, you know, this is feasible in some other enterprises and, you know, also to uh, encourage them to engage in the apprenticeship agreement or to accommodate this uh, inexperienced but skilled workers, they are entitled to one half of the value of the labor training expenses. Now, aside from the new provision, we have this uh, um, interest moment. Uh, interest expense no, as a deduction from gross income. So just like in your uh, individual income tax, I said this is also an allowed uh, deduction for corporation. Okay. Um, are interest expense deductible in full? No. Okay. They are subject to the 20% limitation of interest income. So this is pretty simple. No? So of course, a corporation will incur interest expense from their loans. 
okay? Because they would have to pay interest for the use of the money of the bank or financial institutions. Now, if they have investment in banks or in some financial institutions, they would they will earn interest income. And from your uh, knowledge, interest income is usually subject to final tax of 20% because it's a passive income. Okay, so as a rule, um, whatever interest expense incurred by the corporation, it shall be further reduced by 20% of the interest income that is subject to final tax, okay? The percentage deduction was adjusted from the previous 33% as a result of the lower CIT of 25% under the CREATE law. So this is class uh, what we call as the tax arbitrage scheme because you know it's so easy to kite your resources. So in this tax at our arbitrage scheme, the taxpayer would secure a loan simply to generate interest expense thereby reducing the taxable income and enjoying tax benefit there too. So take note, the more interest expense that you get, uh, that you incur, the lesser your taxable income is and the lesser your tax due. So it's an interplay of the deduction. So ako, kung gusto kong makaiwas ng malaking ano, babayaran na tax, kasi let's say 25%. So um, ang gagawin ko, mangungutang ako sa banko, Okay, so let's say mangungutang ako ng 100 million. So if if I have to finance uh, it as an interest expense, that's deductible from my gross income. So for how much the interest expense deducted from my gross income, that is also how much my tax savings could be. Okay, so if I have, if I have an interest expense, let's say of 10 million and I'm taxable at uh, 25 percent so imagine the savings that i will have so that's 25 percent of 10 million is 2.5 million that's the tax savings i will generate now simply naka ano na ako no naka save na ako ng um uh, taxable income so hindi na ako mag, magbabayad ako ng lesser by 2.5 million now the proceeds of my loan i can reinvest it to uh to, to uh, an income generating investment. Okay, so simply, so parang whatever it is that I may pay for the interest income, kasi 20% lang yung uh, interest income, di ba? So mas malaki pa rin yung savings ko sa tax. So kunyari, yung uh, interest income ko doon, uh, magbabayad ako ng ano 20% tax, di ba? So it's 2 million, di ba? Do you get it? So 2.5 million versus 2 million I, I still have uh, a benefit net benefit of at least 500,000 okay So parang kinakait ko lang yung resource ko So this is why uh, the BIR saw this the the framers of the law saw this as a benefit to the taxpayers a form of tax avoidance that's why any interest expense they incurred will be reduced, further reduced by the interest income subject to final tax. Kasi ang net effect nun, uh, net, uh, hindi na siya net benefit, net loss na sa'yo because the savings that you will be earning from the interest expense will be uh, uh, lower than the 20% final tax that you will be paying for your interest income. So I, I hope you know, I, I clarified on that matter. So this is the tax arbitrage scheme. Okay, uh, let's go to an illustration. So GPS Corporation secured in 2018 a bank loan, okay? A bank loan, oh, sorry. A bank loan for its business expansion and incurred interest expense of 2 million. Okay. In the same year, it likewise earned an interest income of 300,000 subject to final tax of 20%. For calendar year 2020, its gross income amounted to 20 million. Its gross assets, excluding the value of the land where it's building and planned are situated, is 100 million. Its operating expenses, amounting to 10 million, 
uh, I mean, its operating expenses amounted to two uh, to ten million. Sorry, class, I'm just really um, a, a bit sleepy because it's already past one a.m. Okay, so it's the only time that I have the chance to record because mostly the kids are already you know asleep and uh, uh, although one of my kids is here with me now still patiently waiting for me so anyways it's uh, operating expenses amounted to 10 million inclusive of interest expense of 2 million so to compute its allowable interest expense ayun medyo complicated to class kasi ano eh doon siya nagsimula sa 2020 calendar year. So you have to uh, divide 2020 into the old rate and the new rate. Okay, so interest expense. So to uh, compute for its allowable interest expense. So given yung 2 million as interest expense before the arbitrage. Less interest arbitrage. So, so for the first half, so naka-earn siya ng 300,000 subject to final tax of 20%. So 300,000 divided by 2, 150,000. So half of which is uh, uh, applicable with a 33% arbitrage rate. No? Kasi ito yung corresponding rate niya before the CREATE Act. And then simply 20% from July 1, 2020 to December 31, 2020. So, ayun. So, the allowable interest expense is now at 1.920 million. Okay? So, simple as that. Now, moving on, we go to uh, depreciation and depletion. So, this is the man for the use, wear and tear of the assets. So, a corporation who has capital assets, such as equipments, furnitures, and machineries, they are allowed a piecemeal uh, reduction in their income in the form of depreciation expense. So as to the depreciation method, you simply have the straight line method or the most appropriated method divided by useful life. So for example, now just to simplify it, we have a 20 million furniture, okay, or fixture, okay, or a, uh, a capital asset. So each year you're allowed uh, to deduct from your gross income so depending on the useful life so if it's 20 million and you have a 20 year useful life so you'll have around 2 million annual allowed depreciation expense deducted from your gross income okay properties naman use in petroleum operation so itong mga ano nagmimina ng natural gas or oils uh they can also use the straight line method or double declining method over a limit of 10 years uh, for the properties that they use in drilling or in mining. Okay, so in mining naman, uh, dito lang nagkakatalo class, no? kasi mas uh, between five and expected years. So uh, anyway, that's very accounting. Goodwill. So goodwill is not deductible for tax purposes. It's an intangible expense. Startup expense, so very simple. It is deductible when incurred. Walang limitation. Uh, what else? Bad debts. So of course, when you are selling on credit, so nagpapautang yung company, uh, they have accounts receivables. There is a time when, for example, meron silang rule na, Pag hindi na na-collect within five years, you consider that as a bad debt. That's part of your business operation. So you write it off okay, from your books. So it is deductible. So deductible for tax purposes when it is actually written off, no, subject to certain requirements. So, I, so if it's written off from the books, you're, you don't have any plan of um, collecting because it's uh, the probability of collecting is very, very low. Now, uh, on the other hand, kung meron ka namang bad debts na write off mo and then unexpectedly you were able to collect it, that's additional income on your part. Okay? Charitable contribution. So aside from uh, usually yung mga expenses natin class na diniscuss, these are operations related. These are expenses that are ordinary and necessary in the conduct of operations. However, 
uh, according for tax purposes charitable contributions no for the um for your donations to institutions that are commendable or that that are a non non profit okay uh you are also allowed a deductible expense okay the limit is 5% of taxable income so for example your taxable income before the of course charitable contribution is 10 million 5% of that is uh 500,000 so that's the limit so if an actual contribution mo is 700,000 the allowable deduction is limited to 500,000 there are instances naman that the charitable contribution is 100% deductible so provided that the donation is given to BIR accredited donors so may mga societies and association non-profit organizations that are listed by the BIR na o dito kayo mag-donate kasi pag dito kayo nag-donate yung actual na amount of donation will be deductible in full okay or yung mga donation to government priority projects no and certified by NEDA so health sports youth okay ano pa um social welfare okay so those are uh, priority projects of the government. Okay, entertainment expense. Okay, so there is also a limit on this. Huh? So sale of goods or properties. If you're a seller or manufacturer of goods or properties, its limit is 0.5% of net sales. And if you're a provider of services, 1% of net revenues. Okay. Fines and penalties, okay? So, uh, pag hindi kayo nagbayad ng tax, ng tamang buwi sa tamang oras, you will incur fines and penalties. So, interest penalties are deductible, but surcharges and compromise penalties are not deductible. So, ano ba tong surcharges? Pag um, walang fraud na kasama, 25% yung surcharge. Pero pag may fraud, it's 50% of the basic tax. So, you will find this out in your tax remedies in your tax too. So yung surcharge, it's, it's a form of penalty. So it's a generally not deductible. Compromise penalties naman if, if you want to settle no, the tax and don't go, don't want to proceed with the tedious uh, legal battle, you can compromise with the BIR and they will hand you down a compromise penalty of a certain um, of fixed amount. So that's also not deductible. What is only deductible is yung interest penalty. So for the lapse of time, three years, four years, hindi ka nagbaya, that's 12% per annum. Okay. Deduction from gross income taxes. So uh, take note class, uh, income tax is just one of the many taxes imposed by the government. No? So uh, don't limit yourself with that. Taxes can uh, be in the form of local taxes, um, regulatory fees. It could also be business taxes. Uh, it could also be VAT, uh, transfer taxes, and so on and so forth. Uh, commodity taxes, okay? Um, the general rule is that these taxes are deductible, except for the following. Corporate income tax, of course, it's not deductible. Um, foreign tax paid, donors tax, estate tax, tax assessed against local benefits. So real property tax, it's deductible from your uh, gross income. Okay, So local tax on the use of property in business. Okay. Net operating loss carry over. Um, if your bottom figure, so sabi ko kanina, if your gross income minus deductible expenses as we have discussed a while ago, turns out to be negative. So you have a net loss. Okay, So net, this net operating loss that you have incurred this year may be carried over in the consecutive years. And there is a rule on that. So the null co or the net operating loss carry over may be carried over as a deduction also from gross income for the next three consecutive taxable years. So your null co for this year, let's say negative 500,000 net operating loss mo, 
you can uh, uh, apply that as a deduction from your gross income until na exhaust. Okay, so you can uh, deduct that up to three years. Okay, so ma'am, paano kung ano, ang gross income mo lang or ang taxable income mo before null ko is uh, 400,000. Tapos ang null ko mo from previous year is 500. So you can de deduct up to 400,000. Yung remaining na null ko na 100,000, you can still deduct that on the second and the third year. So this is an, on a year-to-year -year basis. So kung sa next year, meron ka na namang panibagong null ko on your operation for the current year, you ano, separate naman. So there can be two null costs or up to three null costs in a, in a single taxable year. Okay? So except losses during the period when the taxpayer is exempt. Okay? So provided there has been no substantial change in ownership. So if in the next year, uh, you have, you know, you have been tax exempt for that particular year. So you cannot uh, no, carry over the NOLCO from the previous year. So kung sa second year, hindi ka na exempt, so na forfeit mo na yung first year. So you can only uh, credit NOLCO for the second and third year. Okay? Under the Bayanihan Act, Nol ko for the taxable year 2020. And so this is presumed no, because of the effect of the COVID-19 pandemic. So mostly talaga, I've seen um, financial statements of big corporation, um, Jollibee, you know, SM, they've incurred uh, big losses okay, from their operations. Um, so yung nol ko nila for the taxable year 2020, so last year and this year, 2021, so uh, uh, instead of the usual three consecutive taxable year, it is now extended to the next five, five consecutive taxable years. So again, that's a leeway granted by the government uh, as a consideration to the uh, effect of the COVID-19 pandemic. So lastly, as an ender, uh, just the same with your OSD or optional standard deduction in your individual income tax, Corporations, I believe domestic and um, resident foreign corporations, so those corporations that are allowed itemized deduction can have the option. So um, instead of, you know, detailing the time, the I mean the line item for each of the deduction, they can simplify it by simply uh, adopting 40% of the gross income as their uh, deduction in lieu of the itemized deduction. So when is and that's your option. Maybe if you don't have substantiation, kung wala ka masyadong resibo, or if it's much beneficial on you, on the corporation, so your uh, accountant or your tax consultant may advise you to opt for the 40% gross income OST. Okay, so unlike in the uh, individual, yung tax base na, uh, nila, is 40% of gross sales or receipt. Dito sa corporation, mas maliit yung tax base because it's gross income. So they are still allowed to deduct the cost of goods sold or the uh, direct cost of operations. Okay, so I think, yeah, that's about it. No? So I, I hope you have learned from the this two-part series and... Uh, I wish you all the best. Uh, just hang in there. You're you're almost done with the semester. I hope, despite this pandemic, you know you're able to motivate yourself to you know really push through the end of the semester. Um, I see you in our final assessment test. So again, thank you for finishing it up to for bearing with me. Uh, I can shorten this, but I just wanted to make sure that everything else is uh, explained with. Uh, so again, thank you for, uh, for your patience. Hopefully, you will all pass my subject. So um, yeah, good night.